Welcome, my name is Derek Pittman. I'm an archaeologist at Bournemouth University. I'm also the deputy head of archaeology there, which is great fun. And if you want to learn more about Bournemouth, just look over there. I'm joined on my right by Lawrence Shaw, who is the National Heritage Lead for Forestry England and purveyor of one of the nicest gazebos in the field today. And we are here as Career in Ruins, which is a podcast all about archaeology. And it's all about learning about how you can get into archaeology and think about all the diverse ways you can engage with the past and archaeology around you, which is why we were invited here today. That's absolutely right, Derek. Thank you very much. So we're here as part of the Festival of Archaeology, which is a two-week festival which takes place across Britain and is um, organised and coordinated by the Council for British Archaeology. And uh, it's the closing event, as you will be aware, of um, the festival here, hosted by the National Trust at Corf Castle in Dorset. And I have to say, it's one of the best settings that we've ever done in a podcast. So it's an absolute pleasure. But what's really exciting is what what we're going to be doing and what we're going to be covering. So we have been joined by an amazing panel today. Um, on my left here and rather than Lawrence and I introduce them one by one we thought we would let them introduce themselves they'll do a much better job of it than us so I'm going to hand over to Neil on my left Uh, Hello, my name's Neil Redfern. I'm the Executive Director of the Council for British Archaeology. So yes, I'm the reason why you're all here, because we want to come to a fantastic location for our closing event of the festival. The theme of this year's festival has been on journeys, and so um, we've all been exploring our own journeys into archaeology. And how do we get into the jobs that we actually do? My journey to becoming the Executive Director of the Council of British Archaeology started 26 years ago, when I actually wrote a letter to the CBA asking, how can I get a job in archaeology? (laughs) And amazingly, somebody wrote back to me. She was called Carol. I'm very good friends with her now. And um, Carol then rang me up and we had an amazing conversation. And two weeks later, I was working for the Council for British Archaeology. So uh, my journey in archaeology, the thing I learned is it's all about people and making connections and actually archaeologists are some of the most helpful people you can find. My mum, however, was utterly convinced it was Indiana Jones uh, of the last crusade vintage. Um, I, I disagree. I, I actually was a, a geographer as a younger, a younger version of myself. I love geography, but I did, agree, did a degree in geography and archaeology. And it was only later in life that I actually learned that two of my grandparents were cartographers. They actually worked for the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. And I just think there's something in my DNA that is deeply fascinated about places and the landscape around us. And I would say I'm on a lifelong journey of discovery of that landscape. And to me, our landscape is like the best book that has ever been written and I'm learning how to read it. But our challenge is half the pages are missing, a quarter of the pages have been overwritten by other authors, and amazingly, this book is still not finished, so we all get to write our own chapters. So we're interpreters, we're authors, we're storytellers, and that really is what led me to my current role as uh, Executive Director. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. Jeanette, please. Hi. Um... I'm I'm Jeanette plummer Uh Up to recently, I was a curator of archaeological assemblages at the British Museum, but I'm happy to announce that I'm starting a new role at the Natural History Museum in a couple of weeks as a bioarchaeology researcher, which is uh, the specialism that, that I developed uh, in my master's. But I'm also a founding member of the European Society of Black and Allied Archaeologists, as well as the chair of the panel of judges for the Council for British Archaeology's Archaeological Achievement Awards. Uh, My journey in archaeology, I think, has to stem from my upbringing. I'm I'm Spanish. I grew up in southern Spain, seeing amazing ruins of all kinds of civilizations. And that really captured my imagination. So I'm one of these people that knew archaeology was going to be the life for me. Didn't really know what that entails and sort of like the twists and turns that that would uh, um, bring about. But as an undergraduate in New York City, I was able to capitalize on all kinds of opportunities, went digging in Iceland and the Caribbean. Orkney was actually my first experience, so that's setting the bar pretty high. Um, And I fell in love with it. Um, 
As an EU citizen, I knew that I, I had the opportunity to come study here, and that's where I specialize in human osteology. Since then, I've been working in the field, but as you know now, I am an indoor archaeologist, <laughs> which uh, I definitely enjoy nowadays. <laughs> you mentioned New York City. How does that compare to Corf Castle? Um, <laughs> putting me on the spot, I love Corf Castle and I love my ruins. And I will say that I do miss New York for sure, but there's something in me that just loves the ruins. And the older, the better. Uh, and that's something that New York doesn't have. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> getting me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucy, tell us about your career in ruins. Oh, hello. I'm Lucy Parker. I'm a current postgraduate researcher at Bournemouth University. Um, but I've had a bit of a varied career because I'm a bit older now. Um, the stools here are kind of like a you know, career path of what I've done. So I was Terrestrial Geophysics Manager at Wessex Archaeology for a while. I'm current chair of GEOSIC, which is the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists Geophysics Special Interest Group. I'm also chair of the uh, CFAS advisory council uh, mostly because nobody else wanted to do it <laughs> but we are the uh, voice of the membership so uh, if you have any queries and you're an archaeologist you come through us my current research is looking at the effectiveness of geophysics within archaeology uh, so i am comparing geophysics to excavated results so it's super fun I love geophysics because, uh, as my name suggests, I'm quite nosy, uh, inquisitive, I think we call it. And I love to see landscapes as they, you know, understanding an archaeological landscape, um, seeing things that nobody's seen for thousands of years, being the first one. Fantastic. Thank you, Lucy. Hugely diverse um, career. Again, it, it, all, all, of, all of you so far is it, it's really highlighting that diversity of interests and experiences. And um, as we do now, we move on to our final panellist, Tom. Hi, my name's Tom Dyer. I'm the Head of Historic Environment for the National Trust, which means uh, as a Head of Historic Environment, I head up the National Trust's uh, archaeologists across the regions and countries in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, um, as well as our central team working to conserve and, and share the heritage that we have across the National Trust estate. Um, I, didn't, I didn't plan on being an archaeologist. I didn't really consider a career in archaeology. Um, uh, but I, I ended up going on a, on a dig in Spain in my teens. And it, it really was just an excuse to get away and have fun uh, and get out from under the watchful eye. Sounds familiar. Uh, and, um, but I fell in love with it. absolutely fell in love with it. The, the hard work, the... Uh, the time outdoors, the sort of friendships and camaraderie you build up in that sort of situation, um, and that little rush of discovery, and that led me on to a, a degree uh, at Exeter University in archaeology, uh, and, and that really rammed home to me that, um, that sort of what Neil mentioned, that lifelong journey that the uh, doing archaeology is a process of understanding more and more and realising that you know less and less about the world around you and that uh, that then led me on to uh, work with the new forest national park authority getting to play with uh, lasers and uh, airborne uh, airborne laser scanning at, at a time when it was still relatively new uh, in terms of its use in archaeology and that was a whole nother other strand of, of archaeology that that I, I sort of learned to love uh, and then ended up joining the national trust uh, as an archaeologist on a community archaeology project uh, about a decade ago um, and, and that's where I really then got a sense as well of just how creative archaeology is as a, as a subject um, the art of, of storytelling and, and engaging with people and, and sharing that kind of passion for the subject and, and I think that's you know, one of, what I love most perhaps about my job as it is now is is working with and engaging with people who are so passionate about heritage and everything they can do um, uh, for people's lives I think that's that's the really great thing that I enjoy. Amazing, thank you Tom so people that may not have listened to our podcast before, they, they what, what we specialise in, what we do is bringing to the fore 
experts like you guys and letting you share your knowledge, your experience and what, why you became who you are and why, why you love what you love. But before we get too in-depth into the subject and the discipline, um, Tom, I've, we're, we are sat in one of the most amazing settings. Uh, just behind us here is this beautiful um, ruined castle. There's some walls just there. There are activities going on and, and a hubbub of, of enthusiasm and excitement. Do you want to talk us just a very brief overview about the National Trust, its, its heritage and Corfe Castle itself. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's a spectacular setting. We're sat in the outer bailey of Corfe Castle. We've got the keep looming high above us, the sort of dramatic uh, ruins rising up. Uh, and it's it's just a fantastic setting and the, the National Trust looks after uh, well we have about 100,000 uh, sites and monuments in our in our records uh, spread across you know 750 miles of coastline quarter of a million hectares of land um, and we look after some some incredible places um, like Corfe uh, through to uh, Chedworth Roman Villa through to Roman gold mines in Wales through to the Anglo-Saxon burial mount at Sutton Hoo I mean there are some real gems and and absolutely that is one of the true perks of 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 my job that i enjoy so much is the sheer variety of of archaeology that we look after um and and we're absolutely committed to sharing that with people you know we really want people to enjoy it to learn about it to um to feel like they uh own it and and uh, and have a part in it um, and that's why we're, we're, we're so pleased to be doing this event here today, that, that we can partner up with the Council of British Archaeology and, and with so many other organisations who have come out today to, to create an, an event where we can really share our passion for, for heritage. It's amazing. And now you mentioned the Council for British Archaeology there, and we are, we've obviously been brought together today as part of the, the Festival for Archaeology, Festival of Archaeology, sorry, um, which is a two-week event, is that correct, which is finishing up today. And Neil, could you tell us a bit more about it? Yes, certainly. So uh, the festival's two weeks. It's the last two weeks of July every year. Um, it's uh, a festival that takes place across the whole of the United Kingdom. It's not confined uh, to one place and lots of organisations and uh, groups doing archaeology just put on activities uh, for people to get involved involved in. And the CBA is really delighted to, to host a website, coordinate all that, actually have some of our own events and, and activities and really give a shop window to everybody about what archaeology can be and what archaeology actually is. And I think the best thing for me is it helps people... Um, bring different perspectives uh, to archaeology. So when I look out in front of me now in the outer bailey of this castle, this castle's actually functioning now like it was intended to, which is to have an awful lot of activity in this particular place. And that's about it being relevant to people. And this, this really does show that, you know, castles would have been noisy, busy, possibly smelly places um, and they wouldn't have all been beautiful lawns and manicured ruins they would have been hives of activity I must admit the, the surroundings here um, and seeing the festival set out it is, as it is today is, is quite staggering, not least because of the pure variety of stalls I can see around me. And Lucy, you alluded to this, but your your career is kind of manifest in these stalls and, and to a degree mine is as well, which is quite exciting. But one of my favourite highlights I think of today is I can see just out of the corner of my eye someone doing some um, bronze working, I can see a flint napper and I can see someone on an Xbox building a castle in mine craft which is absolutely unreal and it's it's sort of two strands of heritage all at once but coming back to the panel our our theme today and our principal theme for this 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 podcast is roots into archaeology and i'm quite keen to dig a little bit deeper into all of our roots into archaeology now for me personally my route into archaeology is all around us i grew up in this village this was my local heritage attraction when i was a kid so it is this is my career in ruins but um, i'm quite keen to hear a bit more about everyone else's roots i think so i'm going to start with lucy and ask what got you into archaeology in the first place um, well, I was looking at a prospectus and archaeology kind of comes first. No, I, I didn't actually start in archaeology. I, when I was 18, I did a degree with, in English with philosophy, but it was in Manchester and I parted a bit hard. So uh, I took a break, did some financial services stuff and realised that wasn't for me. So uh, 
I've always been into history. It was one of those things I, 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 I do the homework and not actually mind. So uh, I started looking more at um, that and I went to the University of Winchester, actually, um, who I think there's some people here today from there. Do you? Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So Lawrence just said he does his PhD there. So um, It's a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, it, 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 like Derek said, when you've got these remains around you, it's, it's really hard not to be enthused by our heritage. Um, I work for Wessex Archaeology as a, a digger um, and worked throughout the south of England. Um, when you work in commercial archaeology, you don't necessarily specialise in a time period. You uh, dig what is going to be, the con- what, what will eventually become construction sites. So uh, I spent my time working on prehistoric ditches mostly, I think. Uh, the the occasional like sunken featured building. Uh, what do you say with all that? So I mean, what, one thing when you gave your introduction earlier, you got a, it, diversity between everyone is here is key in terms of your experiences, your interest. Um, I wonder if there was one thing that did you have a moment when you sat down and went, I love what I do. Maybe you didn't. That's fine. But also, have you got a, a tip? And I'll, I'll ask this to all, all the panelists as we go through. But was was there? Uh, maybe I'll pass this to you, Jeanette. Oh, that, that bit where you went, I love what I do. But also, um, would you recommend anything for anyone? I mean, we've got a hugely diverse group of people here like from age groups. And um, Where can people go and learn more about museums, for example, if they, if they want to get into this uh, subject area? I've always had a bit of a hard time trying to articulate what Jeanette of six years old found interesting with, with, with the ruins. And as I've tried to, to figure that out, I... I think I was just really attracted to this this notion of um, if I engage with the this civilization or these people, I'm I'm part of their story. I get to continue their story, and I think there was something there about storytelling and 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 being that connector of what came before and what happens today or afterwards. So I always thought that I was interested in that, and my idea of what archaeology looked like was very different to what it actually is. But that doesn't mean that it can't be even better so I think my one of my first moments of this is the most incredible thing ever was definitely my second season excavating in Iceland um, worked with an incredible team and I think Tom you mentioned about the sort of the camaraderie you know when you've got a good team together everyone's on the same page um, in terms of their passion their interest and sort of the goal of what archaeology can mean it just it's perfect uh, it doesn't matter if the weather is bad if the archaeology is sort of uh, not as exciting as you think it just it just all works and in Iceland um, that's where I really cemented my interest in osteoarchaeology that was, that was the first place I excavated human remains and I just I was hooked I was hooked with the the possibility the possibility that that archaeology has for for telling stories Um, and in terms of where to go it's it's tricky because I think sometimes digging is projected as the only sort of way in which you can engage with archaeology but there's so many it's so varied and there's subspecialties and almost any interest that you could have within archaeology so and sometimes as well, it can be difficult to, like, you know, you're asking, you know, how do you find out what you do? And I actually find that when you reach out to people, they're generally so keen to talk about what they love to someone they haven't already sort of, like, exhausted all, like, attention span for. So if you're interested in, in anything within archaeology, really reach out to people because um, once archaeology sees that someone is interested, they're, they're happy to take them under their wing and just... just just give advice. Nice. That, that's that's brilliant. And uh, Tom, I'm going to throw throw it over to you a little bit because we've heard how we all did degrees and we might have gone out on research projects. But um, I'm aware the National Trust have got apprentices as well. So there, there are different routes into our discipline. Would you be happy to maybe talk us through a little bit about how people could might get involved with our our amazing subjects in perhaps a non-traditional route. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about, actually, because I, uh, my first job with the New Forest National Park Authority was through uh, an institute for archaeologists, as it was then, uh, bursary placement. Um, and that really gave me that entry in, and I actually ended up working through an MVQ as, as part of that as well. Um, 
uh, and I found it incredibly useful. And I, I've been really, really pleased to, to welcome two um, historic environment advice assistant apprentices to our National Trust teams um, over the last year or so. Um, and they, they've just been fantastic. They have absolutely flown um, uh, Harry and uh, Alicia, if you end up listening to this. Are these people that are, have got archaeological backgrounds or are they coming into it entirely fresh? And they're coming into it with um, uh, with a real passion for archaeology, um, one with a, with a, an archaeology degree background. But absolutely, what we're looking for and what we should be looking for in all archaeologists is, is not necessarily that preset learning, but uh, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a desire to question the world around you and ask why it is the way it is and an enthusiasm to talk about it a willingness to engage with people it's all of those it's all it's all of the reasons why archaeology is such a terrific thing to do because it fills you with so many transferable skills that teamwork that we mentioned i mean it's just incredible for developing uh, your ability to to work as part of a team in terms of creativity and storytelling there there's just so much to it so that that's what we're really looking for and and you know we we're really looking for that as well with with our teams of volunteers we're growing and growing the numbers of volunteers in the national trust who help us look after and monitor and manage the archaeology and, and and we can't do that without volunteers actually it, we need people to to step up and and help us with that work Something you've all mentioned um, throughout the introductions is this aspect of storytelling and being part of the archaeological story. And we feel very much part of Corfe Castle's archaeological story today. But Neil, I wonder if you could allude to that a bit more, what it, what it means to bring archaeological stories into the present. Um, so for me, archaeology, it's history, but then it's history plus 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 because like it's actually so much more you know uh, if you take history being about um, you know the written past well that's very limited we go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years but we use everything around us um the entire landscape the geology the the, the stuff the material and we weave this into this amazing storytelling and what what got me about that was again what my my mum taught me and my mum was Irish and so I she was always taking us places and telling us about myths and legends and then t telling us how those myths and legends shaped her identity and what that actually meant and her her amazing advice was always take a detour because you never know what else you'll find out and this idea that you should thrive through curiosity and endless inquisitiveness and then when you put those things together and you actually start to, to think about it, you find that archaeology is an incredibly creative process. Actually, it's transformative. It, it, we translate what we see in the ground or around us into, into this amazing storytelling. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Why do we do that? Well, because there's so many pages missing. You know, we have to, you actually have to fill in the gaps. And I don't think we should be scared of actually understanding it's we as archaeologists today who fill those gaps in. So it's, it's a very, it's a, a, a discipline of the present. No archaeology is done in the past. It's, it's only done today. And I think that's fascinating. But the other thing that really strikes me about archaeology is that it's the way that skills that people sometimes feel are hidden can come to the front. So I am dyslexic, so I am challenged a lot of the time around writing and reading, and but I have an amazing ability, it turns out, for spotting patterns in landscape. So visually, I do loads of things. And so I found that actually, as an archaeologist, archaeologists, archaeology's empowered and unlocked the skills I have as a dyslexic, as a neurodiverse person. And we know, again, through the Institute, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, and um, work through to profile the profession, that there are a higher than average number of neurodiverse people in archaeology. Because it's about pattern spotting. It's about the cognitive ability to see shapes and relationships and then, really importantly, turn them into stories. I think that's an incredibly important point, Neil. And I, I, I just picking on the neurodiversity aspect a little bit more. Um, can we take a straw poll on the panel if any of us would consider ourselves neurodiverse in some way or another? Um, which is 
a pretty high percentage when you think about taking a straw poll of anywhere. And I'd agree with Neil that as a, as a fellow dyslexic, the ability to see things spatially is, a, is something that I think it's given me an advantage. So while, while a lot of kids in school may see being labelled or being given a label such as dyslexia as a disadvantage, there are, there are strengths. There are strengths that come with with seeing things differently and I think it's really important to, that archaeology is something that straddles the humanities, the sciences across the board with a diverse range of professions, gives a home to people who can think in different ways which is absolutely fantastic That's right um, I'm going to take the subject away slightly different but um, we, we've talked, we've heard a bit, we've, we've got a bit of We've, we've cut a bit of museums, we've cut a bit of outreach and engagement, uh, we've covered a bit about heritage management and, and academic research survey, things like that. Lucy, as our representative of commercial archaeology to a certain certain degree in this 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 panel, I wonder if it's, it's, it's an area that perhaps is misunderstood or not maybe fully understood by the public, but also a really integral part of our discipline, um, not least to feed into that storytelling. We, if we do, if a lot of the work that takes place in commercial archaeology archaeology helps us to understand our histories and our, our, our narratives but could you talk us through about that, that role of commercial archaeology um, beyond yeah the National Trust and Forestry England and, and the CBA? <laughs> what would you like to know? So, as part of the planning process, yeah. So, we, we have systems in place that allow where a new housing development to take place. Okay. We we have planning systems in place which allow us to look into and research and and identify our past activities that took place before we build our new houses. Mm -hmm. But then, so we have commercial archaeologists that have been trained and learned, and they go out and they do that work. But often. That's that's just the part that no one really sees, and it's but it's a really important part, right? It, it's the largest part in the archaeological sector in the UK. Um, I'm doing a bit of work looking at um, geophysics within England, and we're estimating 90 95 percent of the geophysics is commercial. Right. Um, it drives innovation. Um, because we need to do things quicker and cheaper all the time but still retain the quality for the planning process it, it, it it's law in the uk that you need to do some form of archaeological evaluation it, uh, and we work to national planning mppf yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> policy framework um but there's very little in there it, it's quite it, what's the word uh suitably vague because every site is different um, and we would do background research to begin with so we, we would look at doing a DBA a desk based assessment so we would look what's already known and there are places that you yourself can go and have a look at your uh, local area or any area you're interested in um, you can use the Heritage Gateway um, and commercial units will put up their grey literature, as we call it, which is the reports that they've written on any form of archaeological investigation that's taking place already. Um, depending on what you might see in the background research, your county archaeologist would um, hopefully prescribe um, a sensible survey strategy and quite often geophysics comes next because it's a low-cost fast method of effectively evaluating uh, an area. Um, excavation is probably the most recognisable uh, strategy in um, archaeology. We've, we've all seen Time Team. Mm -hmm. Some of us what? have even been on it, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. So, so that work, I mean, the geophysics, the excavation, that all feeds into understanding and and um, and yeah, just building our that narrative of, an, of a local area that perhaps we wouldn't necessarily see if it was agricultural land or anything like that. Jeanette, I wonder if you wanted to come in there. Yeah, um, so I did five years of commercial archaeology and here in the UK, and I I do believe it can be quite misunderstood as a sort of discipline as a sector, but. Coming from a sort of international perspective, I do want to add that not every country has that kind of legislation that requires um, archaeological evaluation prior to any construction. So even if commercial archaeology isn't always perfect, it's still sort of integral to sort of like the values of a country, you know, when you consider 
uh, the protection or at least the the recording of of your heritage prior to potentially destroying it because after all that's what that's what we do isn't it um recorded um scientifically um but you know it's still it's still really a good sign and i think really important aspect of sort of yeah cultural values um to to sort of respect that heritage that's really interesting. And just to, to build on that a bit, um, and it's quite staggering to think that the vast majority of archaeological work that happens in the UK happens through commercial archaeology. It's, they are very much leading the way in terms of that process of discovery. Um, and Neil, from the perspective of the CBA, thinking about that wealth of archaeology that's always happening around us, how can people, wherever they may live, engage and find out more about that archaeology? Um, so... Uh, What's really important is they've just got to keep their eyes open. Um, obviously, challenges are that some of this archaeology is always done behind hoardings because, again, that's the nature of development sites. But again, the local authorities, through the historic environment records, they are integral to actually setting out what archaeology is actually done. Some of our really big archaeological units are absolutely fantastic, at, again, making available the processes they're actually doing. And it's brilliant. We we do have Wessex archaeology here today um, just showing us that. Because, again, they're starting to really understand it's the public value of archaeology and what the public get out of the work they do. That's, a, that's where they create value. Um, so I often describe to everybody the process of archaeology is one whereby we create the collective collage of place, memory and meaning. And you can only do that when you actually go out and talk to people, listen to people and bring them into the conversation so that they can actually start mapping and talking about their area. And I'll just give you one example of where this is relevant. Um, I was involved in a community excavation where um, you had a commercial archaeologist doing the archaeology, using community group to do some of the digging. And the community group loved what they were doing and they wanted to talk about how they were feeling and what the archaeology meant to them because it was in their village. And the commercial archaeologist said, no, no, we don't put any of that in the grey literature report or our report. So the group went off and did an art project and expressed it differently. And when I challenged them to say, why is that? And they said, well, that's not archaeology. But my response to them was the people on the excavation where their average age was 70, which is twice as long as the people who lived in the Middle, in the middle Ages who they were actually excavating. So these people doing the excavation had twice as much lived experience of that landscape. And that's why we need to go and talk to local people, because local people live in local places and they add depth and meaning to our narratives. That's brilliant. Thanks, Neil. And it leads on nicely. Um, I know Tom's put his hand up, but I, I'm going to throw a question at you before you uh, come in, if that's right. Because I, I think, Tom, you're coming at it from a potentially a heritage management point of view, and you went through all these amazing things that National Trust look after uh, on behalf of the nation and, and promote and share. Um, but why do we bother with heritage management? Why is it, why is it important? Why do, what, and, and who decides what's important? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I mean, if if we, yeah, archaeology and heritage management go go hand in hand, and if if, if we're to divide them, I suppose, if we think about archaeology as uh, discovering the past in the present, then heritage management is thinking about how we take that present into the future. So it's it's the process, the choices that we make about. Uh, what we carry forward with us from the past, uh, and uh, and that's a really important thing. That's that's a really uh, important position to to hold, and I and I do think it's incredibly important that you know, we don't just look at it from the perspective of oh, I, I don't know the relative uh, rarity of of a particular type of uh, of monument, um, but but actually from from what people find significant, what people get from experiencing and engaging um with that sort of uh that sort of heritage uh, that's that's pretty i think you pretty much took the, took the bait there perfectly tom thank you and you know i was i guess i'd throw a similar question because uh, all this archaeological work leads to artifacts which go to museums and just s sit in a box um indiana might, jones might say that belongs in a museum but uh, i mean who decides what, what an important artifact is and why, whether it's displayed or not and, and how can it tell a story if it's not on, on display perhaps as well 
That's a, that's a really interesting uh, and sort of complex uh, question in terms of what ends up going in a display. And I mean, some of it comes down to what story is being chosen, right, at any particular time and sort of the budget or what kind of museum um, that that's telling the story. But ultimately, the, the objects are chosen in terms of telling a story so it's, it's almost like story first then you sort of select which object so museums like the British Museum will also bring in loans right so to help sort of tell that narrative and like we've been saying um, also the, the session it, it's all about that storytelling and wh how can you best tell that story um, but then the question of who, who tells the story comes down to the, the sector the prof the profession and that's why it's been so important to to bring professionals with um, different backgrounds different voices that will tell stories that reach different people right because if the same people are telling the same stories you're always going to have the same audiences but if you bring in people from different backgrounds different upbringings um, like Tom was saying different sort of like uh, uh, backgrounds in terms of uh, how what you studied or how you got there that will create um, you know new and exciting stories that, that will capture the imagination of people to, um, you know, and come to museums and engage with, with heritage. Tom, did you want to come in there? Yeah, it was just that, um, that, that storytelling point again, and, and we are chatting there about the, from the object's perspective, and, and I was just thinking about it from, from where we're sitting right now, all of those choices about the storytelling that we're making in this setting in, in Corfe Castle and and how that actually feeds into the heritage management that we do here. So, you know, whether that's historically the excavations that have taken place to uh, clear spoil and, and rubble and soil from these walls, which were previously obscured so that we can share them with people. Uh, but then also to think about how we maintain them in the long term, whether we think about uh, in some places you'll see, for instance, turf capping on the walls to stop erosion happening on those surfaces, right through to, you know, thinking about how access helps us tell those stories. So you'll see a lot of the made paths through these ruins that enable people to get up close and personal in a way that you couldn't necessarily do 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and that has required some pretty significant interventions, actually, some, some pretty significant engineering. When you look up there at the keep and the uh, enormous chunks of rubble that have, that have fallen down from that during its, its demolition after the and during the Civil War, um, there's, there's actually been a huge investment and a huge amount of thought that's gone into how do we manage this site to tell those stories in a way that's really engaging for people. Mm. Fantastic. Neil, do you want to... Okay, so I've got a couple of bits of reflection on this. So um, I was once told a really startling fact by a museum archaeologist. He said, professional archaeologists will be lucky if 1% of anything they ever find in their entire careers will end in a museum exhibit. Now, what do I take from that? Well, I take from that that those archaeologists need to find a different way to tell their story. Yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, we can't leave it till the end of the process. Actually, the process of archaeology is the most fascinating thing that's absolutely here. And then I just pick up on what Jeanette was actually saying. And um, we look at the past as a terribly simple process. And when we write our report and we have our report at the end and you can hold it in your hand, it seems like it was terribly simple. But of course, society isn't simple. Society is deeply complex. And a lot of those complexities are not left as stuff in the ground. And so that's why we have to use our own lived experience in the present and the lived experience of others, other people who've lived challenging li lives, people who've actually had to migrate for work, migrate because of conflict. You know, again, I think looking at the, the impact in the Ukraine, I've, I've been challenged a lot as to why the CBA should stand up and, you know, condemn the bombing of heritage sites in the Ukraine. And yes, it's, it's disappointing. But people are dying over there and they're coming coming to this country how do they feel a sense of being at home or being welcome well you know i can take you to multiple narratives in the past where a similar situation actually happened and that is why we have to center everything we do in the present as part of our lived experience because that's the only way we write meaningful and compelling narratives about the past it's telling us more about ourselves in the past 
That's brilliant, Neil. Thank you. And and relevant to that, but taking us away perhaps from the people working in it or or experiencing the heritage as such, we are in a lived experience at the moment in terms of climate change. And we've had a podcast um, in the past with yourself around the role of climate change in the historic environment. Um, we're in the middle, or we've just come out the end of a heat wave. Um, and that those impacts are going to change our priorities going forward, right? And about um, well, live, how we live our lives, but also what what we might be important in the historic environment as well and, and where we supply resources to managing the, our historic environment and uh, would you be happy to pick up on that too? yeah absolutely i'm i'm all for if you've got an environmental crisis like we have at the moment the first people you should be turning to are archaeologists yep. why because we study the process of human society environmental failure so we've seen it all before and we'll see it all again and we need to understand that is where our our processes and our conversations can become so valuable we can't stop the change but we can help people understand change isn't new change we can adapt we can um, uh, change the way we actually behave and and look at different ways of doing it society has done it in the past and so again i think that's the really important thing about archaeology it's actually not about the past, it's actually about the present and what it means to be human on this planet at this moment in time. Tom? I think there's some really, um, there's some really practical, tangible aspects to it as well. I mean, we're, we're thinking about, for instance, the need to plant huge numbers of trees for, for carbon sequestration in, in particular, um, but also addressing the, the kind of joint nature crisis as well as the, as well as the climate crisis. And archaeology in the historic environment can, can really help us target that work. It can show us where woodland has been in the past. It can uh, indicate where it's more likely to be successful. The same is true of wetland environments as well. So there's some, there's some really practical applications. that we, It's about learning from the past. It's about paying attention and learning from it. I think that's a really good point, but also demonstrating landscape land use change over 100, 1,000, 2,000 years. No landscape stays static, right? So actually, there'll have been trees here a long time ago, and there'll be trees there in a long time in the future. But we are a small point in time, and but taking all, all our knowledge and all our experience into shaping that is a, is a really good point. Absolutely. And I'm keen to, to move on a little bit, I think, because we've been talking now for a good 45 minutes and I'm acutely aware as I gaze out to the people around us that people normally listen to podcasts to fall asleep of an evening. So we should uh, we should start thinking about how we bring this to a close. But I wanted to get on to some important points about there's loads of people here who've been asking us questions all day and uh, we've been doing our best to tell lots of archaeological stories. But I'm quite keen to think about the world of archaeology and how we can encourage more people to come and join us because the more people who do what we do the better i think so i'm going to come to lucy and ask you a question that we've we've been asked a couple of times as we've we've done events like this and that's um can i still be an archaeologist if i don't want to do digging yes i am case in point um archaeological geophysics can be seen as a nice walk in a nice park or landscape with a machine that goes ping but more and more we're actually moving to toad arrays so it could be a nice drive around a nice site so even easier uh, I, I'm really a big fan of archaeological science um, and there are many of my friends and colleagues who uh, aren't actually field archaeologists have never really owned a trowel um, and they may be more laboratory based they would of course go to site for a lovely jolly to see some excavations and work out where um, whatever material they're working with um, fit, fits into a site um, but you also have, we have people on the Wessex store who are outreach specialists um, you have fine specialists so uh, we have people who can be uh, pottery specialists uh, osteoarchaeologists so that's a fun one we've been playing with bones on our store um, but yeah, there are some archaeologists that don't like dirt. Something we've been looking at with Historic England, because I'm a CDP student for Historic England and AHRC, I meant to say at some point here, um, is, is digital archaeology. Yeah. And uh, Lawrence is actually chair of um, CAA, so we'll be going what, there. Lucy, what does CAA stand for? Computer archaeology <laughs> stuff. Computational applications in archaeology and quantitative methods. <laughs> that um 
Yeah, we've been looking at digital recording methods, mm. and uh, so we have many archaeologists that never get dirty. I, I'm going to pick up on the, the science even there, because I, I too am a fellow archaeological scientist. I, I love a bit of archaeological science. Um, I find one of my specialism, specialisms is in the world of archaeological chemistry, and I can make an admission now that nobody's listening, that as an A-level student, I failed chemistry miserably, like catastrophically failed. But when I start to apply it in archaeology, it got very interesting, and suddenly it was much more interesting to learn about. And I can see that, Neil, you want to come in here. Yeah, I got a U in my O-level chemistry, and I was very pleased with it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Jeanette, um, so yeah, again, thinking beyond digging, obviously you work in the museum sphere. Uh, how would you kind of describe and define your current career trajectory in archaeology, and, and where's it going to take you next? I've never at any point in my career been able to answer that question because um, for me in archaeology, it's been very much about pursuing my curiosity and my passions. Um, I started out thinking that I'd go uh, into a material culture aspect, but when I started taking classes in university, I it wasn't my thing, and then I discovered bones, and um, that, that just captured my, my my interest and ever since then it's been sort of a, a, a stumbling almost into different, not stumbling I worked really hard but sort of like uh, this, this notion of not really knowing where I was going but knowing that I was going in the right direction because I was following my interests. So I'm very excited about this new role as I'll get to be a bioarchaeology researcher, get to you know focus solely on um, on, on osteology and I'm, I'm really excited where, where that will take me that's <laughs> my best way uh, to answer that question fantastic thank you for that Tom in terms of where you are today uh, you, you, you've got a big big team that you manage you, you work o over a huge area you've got a big remit in terms of management engagement education um, could you whittle down maybe a, a single bit of good advice that you've had in your career or, or could you give a bit a, a nugget of advice to anyone that perhaps might want to take a similar career tra trajectory as you? I, I think it's just about exploring. It. There, are, there are just so many areas of archaeology that you can get involved with. And, and if you can find ways of, of dipping a toe in here or there and seeing what you learn. I've, I've just... I would call it stumbling, but I, I stumbled from 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 one joyous thing to the next, and at each stage, I've discovered something new about archaeology to the to the point of, you know, from community engagement work to to now doing some work around the use of artificial intelligence to to automatic uh, automate detection of, of features. I mean, it's just. It's mind-boggling. So it, it's it's seeing what's out there, and and there's there's so much out there to get your teeth into now as well. Particularly since the pandemic, and a lot of courses moving online, a lot of lectures moving online, conferences more accessible, and hopefully that's all going to continue. Uh, there are just yeah, so so many aspects to it. Um, my advice would just to be to try if you can to find the time to explore it. Excellent. Now, we've mentioned some of the, the joys of working in archaeology and heritage so far, particularly the community element, and often working around really nice, incredible people, and I can certainly attest to that, mostly. Yeah. Um, and one thing, though, that kept me personally in archaeology, and I think I can probably speak for Lawrence here as well, is that you get to see quite a lot, you get to move around a lot and travel quite a lot. And I've been incredibly fortunate to, to travel around. And Lawrence, have you ever been anywhere? Oh, I might have been to a few places like Easter Island or the Cook Islands. How about you, mate? Are you happy I teed you up? Yeah, there? thanks. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to open it up to the panel, really, and just ask, have you guys been able to travel with archaeology and see things? And, and has anyone got any good stories to tell? One of the questions that sometimes comes up uh, in, in these sorts of discussions is, what, what's the best thing you've ever found? Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, and, um, and I never know how to answer it. Uh, but perhaps the best thing I found was uh, my wife. Uh, so I'm going to earn some brownie points. Uh, <laughs> Me too. And, and lug that one. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, and and that was uh, that was actually on a trip out to Sri Lanka, uh, which I absolutely pinched myself. I, I sort of took it for granted while it was happening, and now I just can't can't understand how. Um, but I went out there to do some experimental. Uh, iron workings, experimental metallurgy, reconstructing furnaces 
on in the, in the hill country in, in Sri Lanka uh, and, and waiting for the monsoon winds to whip over and, and fire up those furnace temperatures, which is just mind blowing. I mean, I would never have I would never have imagined that that's the situation I find myself in. And um, and it turns out all you need to do is, is is you know isolate the person that you like for about six weeks <laughs> from all other contact and, and you'll be fine. That's the words to live by, Lucy. <laughs> I don't think any of us could really follow that one. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I'll find a partner, wife, husband at some point. I'll... No, uh, my um, master's research was on Unst, which is the most northern of the Shetland Islands. So I was fortunate enough to have all expenses paid um, by Shetland Amenity Trust. Thank you very much. Um, and we surveyed on uh, Vinstrik, which is a peninsula in the middle of nowhere, right next to a brock. It was beautiful. We would have seals watching us from the sea, undertaking a physical survey, uh, sea otters, puffins. It was somewhere I would never have had the opportunity to go to. And, you know, our commute to work was walking over the beach. It was just perfect. Sounds dreadful. (laughs) Jeanette, any good stories? I think the closest my archaeological career has come to sort of like an action adventure uh, was definitely in Antigua and Barbuda, um, in the Caribbean, in an island that where every plant wanted to kill you, whether you touched it or looked at it slightly, but getting bitten by fire ants uh, sort of in the process, that that was the most probably exciting. Um, although I, I do have to give a shout out to sort of like my three seasons in Iceland because mm. those really cemented sort of um, my, my passion and my dedication to archaeology. Fantastic. And Neil, I know your role at the moment involves a lot of travelling around. You must have some good stories. Um... I do. I, I, I do. <laughs> Any you can tell. <laughs> um, possibly. Um, okay, so so travelling around. So, first of all, I took a very conscious decision when I was younger that I didn't think we actually understood our own place very well. So, I, I have not actively travelled um, abroad, except to the Republic of Ireland, around archaeology, because I actually felt this was our place and we should understand it a bit better. And what I've found in doing that process is if you go to a place as an archaeologist, you close your mind off to all the stories that you might find about that place. And so I would encourage anyone to travel as an archaeologist, but travel with an open mind and and think about the questions you ask when you go to those places uh, and make sure they're really open questions. And then you'll find there's a different world out there and a different set of experiences. And you can find extraordinary conversations in the most humble of things, like a brick with a name on it, (laughs) can take you on an incredible journey. And it can take you on a journey of discovery with the human being you're talking to. And again, where I get to with that is is this amazing thing we do called archaeology well i'd argue every single person out there is an archaeologist you you only need one question in archaeology and it's why that's it that's the first question you ever ask it's the simplest one go and ask why we really need to re-empower it but then ask it as the as the catalyst for the next three things you need to do which is that thing about curiosity going out and looking it is that thing about inquisitiveness but realising that you're never going to be successful in this job unless you do the creative bit at the end, which is create that new meaning. Come back to that issue we've done about storytelling. But paint, go and paint pictures um, and use all that material. But yeah, in my journey is what I found is the depth of my experience comes from the, the depth of the conversations I create on the way. And you, can, you can go anywhere and ask a dull question. You know, you can go anywhere uh, and have a conversation that can lead into the most extraordinary engagement if you ask that question humbly and right. Fantastic. And what a lovely note to begin drawing ourselves to a close. And I can see out of the corner of my eye the events team telling me to hurry things along because there's a busy schedule ahead of us today. Um, but before we let you all go about your day, we just want to say a few thank yous and plug a few things, really. Um, first of all, thank you to the CBA and the National Trust for hosting us today. We've had an absolutely wonderful morning and we're going to continue wandering around and chatting to people throughout the afternoon. Derek's absolutely right. I think if we just want to go down the line, if any of you got any final things you want to highlight, direct people to, or, or just um, give a shout out to them, please take this as your opportunity. 
I, I just want to say a massive thank you to, to everyone that's been involved in making today happen. The, the National Trust team, some of my colleagues, the Perbeck team here, CBA, all the people who've turned out to enjoy the event, uh, all of our stallholders. It's just, it's fantastic to see it. It's the sort of stuff that lifts the heart. So it's great. Thanks, Tom. Do you see anything you want to point people towards? Oh. Um, well, the amazing um, BU stand just to our left, maybe. I, I was going to thank <laughs> the don't. Bournemouth Archaeology and Anthropology Society for their volunteers. We have the wonderful Shelley, Rob, and Andrea here today helping us. Um, oh, and Derek. He, he spent at He's least 30 <laughs> seconds on the stool. Um, but um, with archaeology being a journey, I, th I think it's important to reinforce that it can be. Um, part of your journey, whether it be your career, your hobby, or just an interest at the weekend. We have so many opportunities. The CBA has got a great website, which gives you so many ideas for volunteering. Um, it, it just, yeah, archaeology has added significantly to my journey, and I just wish the same for everyone. That's wicked, thank you. Jeanette? Well, I'd like to thank, for sure, the CBA for the Festival of Archaeology, which is amazing. Um, but also for maybe speaking more directly to anyone listening who questions whether they can be an archaeologist or not, because archaeology doesn't seem like the place where they might belong because they don't see anybody who looks like them. Um, you know, just to point out that archaeology is for everyone and there is space for everyone. And I would encourage anyone who has an interest in it to pursue that passion and see where that leads them because it's led me on a journey that I wouldn't change for the world. Amazing. Thank you. Neil, you've got two minutes to take us home. Okay, so everybody, you now need to go on your own journey to the CBA stand over there because we're doing a cracking offer of 50% discount on our membership. Whoa. So our membership pays for all of this. So if you've liked what we've done today, please go over to the CBA stand. And just as an added inducement, I will be manning that stand for the next hour. So you will be able to pin me down and actually ask, what do you get for your money <laughs> when you join the CBA? And I will be able to tell you. Um, but as ever, I would absolutely like to thank Lawrence and Derek um, for, you know, what you don't know is they actually provide their time to the festival for nothing to do this edition of Career and Ruins. And I am extremely grateful for them because they always pull out great conversations. So, gents, thanks very much. Absolutely our pleasure. And a huge thank you as well to everyone that's been listening. Oh, Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> And um, if you don't already, please like and subscribe. Like Career, in and <laughs> Career in Ruins. Career in Ruins. On all good podcast providers. <laughs> Thank you.